Hi everybody, welcome, 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 man. I'm so excited today for this uh, podcast. I have with me uh, my very, very good friend and brother in Christ from South Africa, uh, Prophet Gerard Brith here. And uh, uh, we have had so many podcasts together. Uh, today, uh, we are uh, speaking on, or he's speaking on, a, a very important topic and uh, uh, I would love to learn from what he's sharing and this is going to be an amazing podcast and uh, completely out of the box podcast. So we're going to learn something today and uh, our topic for today is uh, why uh, Christians uh, or why people don't really need to go and take water baptism um, and say uh, to become Christians. So that's that's what we're going to discuss on. And here we have Charat. Thank you so much for uh, coming on this podcast. Thank you, my brother Vernal. It's such a privilege, and thank you for this opportunity, so that I can uh, also be with you guys and uh, via internet, uh, not in person, but we are we are. We are together and to fellowship just with you and to just share what God is busy doing and the goodness of God that we just realize on this journey more and more how big and how awesome our father is and the work that he has finished on the cross is not work that we must try ourselves trying to accomplish ourselves trying to perfect it by ourselves but that he did the perfect job that we can rely on and trust on and enjoy what he has done for us. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So let's head straight on to the topic. And uh, uh, let me begin with this question. Why do you think uh, Christ, uh, people don't need uh, water baptism uh, okay. to call themselves Christians? Okay. Um, what's very important, Bernal, that we must realize is what was Jesus' purpose? What did he came for when he came to this earth? The very purpose he sent for was to reconcile man with God. Okay, so he came for reconciliation. And I like to believe that he was successful in what he's done. So he didn't come to try to reconcile, but he did reconcile. And that's what's the whole message of the cross. What we call the good news, the gospel, uh, is a message of reconciliation, not a message of separation. So if we try to do stuff on our own, there's references and we're going to hit into it and we're going to see now all this that people uh, say, but this is the, what the Bible says. But we skip also a lot and we've got a different perspective on the word because of how we were raised in a certain way. In If we say Christianity, if we are raised in Christianity, uh, you know, I, I laugh normally because, you, you know, there's this one guy that says, you know, you only raise cattle. OK, you can't be raised a Christian. OK. <laughs> And that's what I, you know, I, I like to refer to myself. I'm not a Christian, but a son of God, because a Christian means a follower. And I believe Jesus Christ that he paid was not to make me a follower of him, but to make me his body. That's why I'm called the body of Christ. So there's no separation because being a follower is still separated because you are walking after somebody. You follow after him. But if you are the body, it means you became one with that person. And that's what Jesus tried in John to come and say. He, his last prayer, where he comes and says, Father, do not take them out of this world, but make them one with us. Like you, the Father, and me are one. Let them be one. So that's what I like to believe. And I believe that's what Jesus came to accomplish, to make all one. And if we go to Ephesians and we read uh, chapter 1, uh, verse 10, it comes, it talks about at the appointed time, Christ was manifested. And then it says, this was the hidden purpose of God, to, to come and consummate everything, all things on earth, all things in heaven into one place, into Christ Jesus. And I believe that's what Jesus came to do, to take all the old world, the old system, the old nature. Uh, he took it and he made it one with him so that there is only one body, not sinner and saint, but the body of Christ everywhere. OK, so now we come to baptism because a lot of people through the ages try to say that's the only way is to reconcile ourselves in his death and in his resurrection. 
Okay, so we're going to look a little bit in, and it's a big thing. I mean, since the beginning of church, if we talk even about the Catholics, uh, now these days they even go, you must be baptized when you're adult, or is, does it matter if you baptize if you're a baby? You know, and all these issues that's coming up. And what they actually miss is a bigger reality that Jesus came to do. So I've got a few scriptures, if it's fine for you, just to fall in and just to bring over a different perspective, maybe. And then we go a little bit deeper with some of the baptism scriptures uh, awesome, that is awesome. in the Bible. Is it fine? Awesome. I, want yes. to, I want to start quickly by Romans chapter 5, because, you know, this, this changed my life. <laughs> this very ch uh, chapter and i can start at romans chapter 5 verse 8 it says but god shows and clearly proved to his own uh, love for us by the fact that while we were still sinners christ the messiah died for us so yes one number one while we were sinners jesus died for us okay so jesus doesn't die the minute that you decide not to be a sinner he died before while you were yet and if we go and uh, actually go and see history jesus died more than two thousand years ago it's before most of us were ever no none of us that's now watching this were born at that stage you understand so he died for all humanity while they were still separated from all okay then it goes on and i want to jump quickly to verse 18 because if you go and read the whole chapter it goes about what the first adam and what the second adam and how Christ actually came and finished it. Verse 19 comes and says, For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Now that's verse 19. So by one's disobedience, what Adam has done, all men were in sin. And actually, if you go and read uh, chapter 5 on, it comes and says that uh, no man could escape this death. Okay, so no one could escape what Adam did, but yet we want to escape what Jesus has done. And it comes and says, if we go, if I jump just one verse up uh, to verse 18, it says, Well then, as one man's trespass, one man's false step, and falling away led to condemnation for all men. So one man's act of righteousness to quittle right standing with God and life for all men. So then it just comes and confirms it in 19. By one's disobedience, all were led into sin. By one's obedience, all into life. So you know what's the whole thing about baptism? People talk about it's an act of obedience. Okay, that's another point. Except that you are raised now to a new life. They come and says it's an act of obedience that we have to do. But the word comes and says it's not your obedience that comes and puts you into a new creation. It is Jesus that was obedient to fulfill what he said and to give his own life so that while we were still sinners, he reconciled us back to himself. So it had nothing to do with you. And that's where a lot of people come and they said, but, uh, you know, we take free choice away. OK, but if we go and we say that, uh, you know, you have to receive and you have to baptize yourself so that you can be safe. What choice is there then? then you also still have no free choice. So it's exactly the same. And if we go, you, just, you know, a lot of people like to bring the romance part into it. I know I'm maybe touching a little bit uh, on the side of the topic, but it's just to prepare the mind so that when we get more to the baptism, that it's easier to understand. You know, we, we, we bring the romance in and say, you know, if I marry my wife, she must have a choice. Okay, so now we try what our society tells us, and we try to interpret the word of God according to that. If we go to the origin of man, Adam never had a few wives walking, and God says, choose a wife for you. He gave him a wife. And so he was the first Adam, and so Jesus was the second Adam. And we are his bride. He didn't prepare a few brides. He prepared one bride, and that's all of us, all of humanity. And he paid the price. It's by his blood. That we are made perfect. It's his blood that washes us clean. It's not our works. It's not our efforts. And a lot of people try to bring faith into it. You know, you must have faith. And by faith, then you must do acts of faith. Otherwise, it's no faith. Faith without works is dead. Okay, but they must understand what Galatians comes and says. So I quickly just want to touch on Galatians 2 verse 20. It comes and says, I am crucified with Christ. Now it talks about you are crucified okay we're going to read a little bit later uh, more about that uh, nevertheless i live yet not 
but Christ live in me and the life which I live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. So by whose faith are we living? Are we believe that my faith makes me a new creation? Or do I believe his faith perfected me? Because if we go and read the Bible, Paul is so often right, it says faith came with Christ. <laughs> so before Christ, no faith. Faith was Christ himself. So he is faith. So when faith comes, I won't rely on me. So it changed the whole picture of by my faith, I get saved. You don't get saved by your faith. You were reconciled back with him while you were a sinner by his faith. So, so it's a total different picture that the word of God portrays for us there. So then I just want to go uh, quickly to 2 Corinthians. Sorry, you must, you must stop me if I'm going like too fast. <laughs> but I'm so excited. This is so <laughs> awesome. So can I continue just? Yes, yes, please do. Okay. So 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I want to quickly read from verse 14 and 15. It says, for the love of Christ controls and urges us, impels us because we are of the opinion and the conviction that if one died for all, then all died. And this is so awesome because what is baptism? We say we let the old man die. But what the word actually comes and says, if one died, then all died. So Jesus was the pioneer of our faith. So he was the one that died. So the Bible also comes to Paul, right? He took our appointment of death. So he died for all humanity. Okay. For all sin. Uh, when we read about John the Baptist, he was the actual, the first one that baptized in a different way than what the Jewish culture was doing at that time. Because before that, the whole baptism was before cleansing, before they can go into, uh, you, you know, into deeper rituals to be cleansed, before they can go and sacrifice and all that type of things. So when we talk about John the Baptist, the first time that he saw Jesus, he says, behold, the Lamb of God that's going to take away the sin of the world. And yet up to date, People don't believe that sin was taken away. So they believe by being baptized, you'd lay down sin. And the carnal nature, the old Adam that was sinful, which is a lie. Because Jesus took away. So we say, yeah, we unify us when we are baptized in his death. Okay? It's not us that unify ourselves in his death. He took all humanity into his death. He's the owner that of taking the appointment. You don't decide to uh, that he takes your appointment or not. He decided for us, I'm going to experience this for everybody. I'm going to bring, bring victory to all humankind. I'm not going to leave it up to them because if we leave it up to them, they will never. He left it up to us or to humanity before he came on the cross. And the Bible comes and says that no man could fulfill the law. No man could save himself. That's why he needs a savior. And then John the Baptist says, behold, the lamb, the savior, that's going to save us from the condition of sin. And that's what Jesus came to do. He saved us from the condition of sin. Uh, if we go to Romans chapter six, it actually comes and says exactly the same thing. He says, how can you who die to sin live in sin any longer? Okay, so uh, sometimes we come and we, we bring it like, how can you? How can you do what you are doing right now? You said you died to sin. You went through baptism. Now you're still doing sin. You understand? And that's not what it says. He says, how can you who've died? So meaning, how can you that were appointed was taken to bring an end of an old creation? How can you live in sin if he dealt with sin for everybody? So then he goes on. It says uh, in, John, uh, uh, in Romans chapter 6, then Paul writes on. And he comes and says, count yourself now also dead to sin, but alive to God. So that's where the whole thing, because baptism is all about laying down the sinful nature. But what if you have no sinful nature because Jesus paid the price for sin? He dealt with sin once and for all and will never deal with sin again. He made sin out of the he took sin out of the equation so that sin can never play a factor for any person anymore. But, you know, we look around us and we see certain behaviors and then we say that's sin and that's not sin and this is this and this. 
But what was sin was the disobedience, and Jesus took disobedience away by his obedience. And we must come to a mindset, what Adam did, is it much greater than what Jesus came to do? Are we still trying to, re- to, to, to live and Adam's work is greater than Jesus? Or what Jesus did superseded what Adam did, and he brought us into a perfect state where he comes in Revelation and he says, look, I made all things new, not some things, not those who choose to be new. I made you. He comes and says, I made all things new. Then all things are new. So then we are part of the new creation and we are living in a new manner, a new way. And if he died for one, then all died. So if all died, then all is also raised to a new life. So then baptism takes a different form. And then we must go and look what the scripture says and how we interpret it previously and actually get the true meaning behind it to see what Jesus referred to when he talks about baptism, what the apostles talk about when they refer to baptism, because it's something different, because we must also realize that the church fathers played a big role in translation of the Bible that we have today. And a lot of them is changed according to the scribe that was writing, you know, down and translating. He, he translated with certain beliefs that he had in his heart and what he was uh, raised with or uh, given to him. He translate with that. And there's many things that was mistranslated, unfortunately. And I will go and share like one or two of them uh, later on. But I just want to continue here uh, also in. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14, where I was busy. Verse 14 says, For the love of Christ, control us, urge us, impulse us, because we are of the opinion, conviction, that if one died for all, then all died. Then it says in verse 15, And he died for all. So there is not the opinion that some must still die then, because he died for all. How many deaths must people then die? That's what we must come to. How many deaths is there? If Jesus died and he died for all, and then you must come, then he talks about more deaths. And then they want to uh, talk about a physical death also. So how many deaths is there then, according to our Bibles, that we must die there? You understand? So, so there's something that we must realize. So it goes on. And he died for all so that those who live might no longer uh, live for themselves. But to and for him who died and was raised again for their sake. So this is awesome news. So what normally we say is the baptism where people have to lay down their life and they are raised with God. He did it by himself and not requiring you to go and lay down your life in some way. He did it. And if one died, all died. Yeah. Awesome. 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 So, um, um what uh, uh, what kind of baptism john the baptist was doing okay that's the big thing that we have to go and look to um you know when we go to uh let me just get it i want to quickly read some scripture uh, on that um but look, can i touch on it now yeah jumping uh, to the, we're gonna we're, i'm gonna answer that question as per uh, convenience. I just want to, <laughs> <laughs> Because that's very important what you say, this, the, the yeah. baptism of John, and it's referred to in the Bible. And we're going to see now what it is. And then there's something that John referred to himself, because he comes and he says, uh, I baptize with water, but the one that comes after me, referring to Jesus, is going to baptize with spirit. So, so that's something else, because the baptism that we see in Christianity is mostly the baptism of John, uh, and it's not the baptism of Christ. And that's where the, pr- the problem comes in. Okay, so we're going to have a different uh, look at those two. Uh, But I just want to go quickly to Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, before we go into that. It comes and says, Galatians 2, verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. In him, I've shared his crucifixion. It's no longer I who live, but Christ the Messiah lives in me. And the life I now live in the body, I live by faith. Now, whose faith? That's the faith of Christ, okay? By faith in and reliance to the son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. So he gave himself up for us. Now what people try to do is to try to give themselves up for him. And that's not what Jesus came for. He came to reconcile man and God, not to make man nothing. (laughs) And that's the problem. And that's what people try to do. They want to make man nothing, not realizing that Jesus has done it already. 
He made us one with him so that we can live in union with him. Not trying to become into union with him, trying to be reconciled with him and striving to be reconciled. He has done it once and for all by his crucifixion and his resurrection. Now, I'm going to quickly want to start because one great thing is a lot of people go to, you know, Matthew uh, 28 verse 19, where we find the great commission. <laughs> you know, it's a big thing because that's what drives the Christian church to go and do baptism. Yeah. Okay. Go preach the gospel, you know, baptize them, disciple them, you know, all that verse, you know, and, and that's where a lot of people hang on to. And what's very funny, if you go and you can just go and Google it, you'll find the, the, the argument behind it, that a lot of people come and it's actually proof that in the original writings, it doesn't appear until 325 after Christ. This verse is finding its way into the Bible. So many believe that this was written by Constantine. Many believe that it was written by the ch other church fathers and it was placed in to bring forth, you know, the, the drive behind the Catholic Church to go and conquer the world, to bring that force to go. You must wow. go. Okay. So <laughs> okay. that's what's, what's behind it. So, mm -hmm. you know, and then there comes the argument. If we want to get it clearer what this verse actually should like, like look like, if it was the genuine word that was in there, the genuine translation would have been more like Luke tried to bring it over. Okay, in Luke chapter 24, verse 46. Now Luke comes and says this in the following way. And this is so awesome, Vinal, because this changed the whole picture. Luke 24, uh, verse 46 to 47. It says, and he said to them, so it's written. And so it, uh, so it behalfed Christ to suffer and to raise from the dead on the third day. So it starts with, this is what happened. Christ died. And he was raised. Then 47 comes and says, and that repentance and remission of sins should be proclaimed. So it's not go and preach. It's a proclamation. It's bringing mm -hmm. the good news. Good news is not telling you, hey, you've got a choice. That's not good news. Good yeah. news is, hey, you, you've got the jackpot. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't even enter. But it's mm -hmm. there. You, you understand. So it comes and says, the good news is, and the the repentance. Now, the repentance is not like we say you, you must fall on your knees and you declare that you are wrong. Repentance, if you go and look, the word there is changing the mind. And that's what Jesus also said. Change your mind for the kingdom of heaven is at the hand. So it's a change of mind. So there comes a change of mind. And this is what must be brought. A change of mind of the remission of sin should be proclaimed. So it's not that they must bring remission for sin. They must not tell people to it is to proclaim that the sins are forgiven, okay? Uh, proclaim and his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. So he says, this is what actually what it is. The go is not to go and let people uh, repent and say they are sinners and realize they are sinners. And now they have to be baptized and now they have to become a follower because that's also what, you know, what uh, it means when you become a uh, 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 What's the word now? Sorry. <laughs> you become, uh, uh, Jesus help me. Uh, a follower. Uh, uh, come on, Vernal. Yeah. Go preach the gospel, baptize them and make them disciples. Disciple means what? A follower. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So they want to make followers and to become a follower, you have to be baptized according. Yeah. And that's why we see all of this stuff because people try to make followers also for Christianity, a religion for themselves. Mm. You yeah. understand? But what he says is not to make followers. He says to proclaim the good news that he set them free. That's the message that needs to go out and to be proclaimed among all the people. Now in okay. John chapter 3, is, are you still all right? Yeah. Yeah, I was about okay. to ask you about John chapter 3 verse 5. Okay. Okay, I'm going to start at verse 1. Okay. And we quickly just going to touch on that. And I'm going to end with five because let's make it awesome. Now there was a certain man. Okay. John three verse one. So this is Jesus and we know Nicodemus. Okay. And we read stuff into it that is not said. I don't know. You know, sometimes that's what we like to do. What we have been taught over the years uh, by people. We like to read it into the Bible 
uh, because that's how we are trained to see things out of that perspective. And sometimes we need to take our perspective away, get rid of that filters and see out of a new perspective what Jesus tries to tell. And I've actually preached a few weeks ago the whole thing about uh, Nicodemus and Jesus that says you must be born again. And a lot of people misunderstand that whole concept of it. But I'm trying to just touch because we want to go into the baptism of John and all this stuff also. So you must tell me when we the time is running or whatever. But I'm sure you're also enjoying it like I'm me. I'm enjoying and I'm excited. <laughs> I want to learn something new from you now. Okay, John chapter th- uh, 3 verse 1. Okay, it comes and says, Now there was a certain man among the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler, a leader, authority amongst the Jews, who came to Jesus at night and so that he uh, uh, say to him, Rabbi, we know and are certain that you have come from God. So he comes and he says to him, I'm sure you come from God. Okay. For none uh, can do the things, the signs, okay, that you produce uh, because it's a proof that you, uh, unless God is with you, okay? So he comes and says this. Now, Jesus, out of the blue, this man actually comes and says, hey, I admired you because this is what you do. You can only do if God is with you. Then Jesus, out of the blue, just answers him something, okay? And now people take, but they don't understand what the whole thing behind it is. It comes and says in verse 3, Jesus answered him, I assure you most solemnly, I tell you, that unless a person is born again anew from above, he cannot ever see the kingdom of God. Okay, now here comes the, the whole boomerang in this story. Okay, how can you be born from above? Okay, where's the kingdom according to the people? above so now he comes and says you cannot enter the kingdom except if you are born from the kingdom and people don't read that in there so how do they think kind of people going to enter the kingdom so that they can be born from the kingdom you understand we want to let people go and we think that uh, if we go on with john chapter 3 it says flesh gives birth to flesh and spirit gives birth to spirit so flesh cannot bring forth spirit but spirit brings forth spirit. So if we want to own our birth, I cannot decide to be born again. I couldn't even decide it in the flesh. I mean, that was my, my parents' decision. I didn't have a choice. Jesus didn't get at me and said, hey, do you want to be born? And I said, yes, let me go. It's my turn. And here I am on earth. Okay. It was not my choice that I was brought into this life. And now we want to make it your choice to be born spiritual. No, it's not. It's your heavenly father's choice. And it was a choice that pleased him. If we read the gospels, he comes and he says, it is an act that was worthy and pleasing unto God. So he gave us birth to the new creation. Then it goes on. Sorry, I, I get a little bit of <laughs> distracted there with the awesomeness of God. Okay, so he says, no one can enter the kingdom of God uh, except if he's born from above. Then verse four comes Nicodemus and he say to him, how can a man be born if he's old? Can he enter his mother womb again and be born? So now Nicodemus wants to try to refer to natural birth. And Jesus says, hey, just as your mother gave you birth, you're going to be born again. That's why he says you have to be born again because he's going to give birth. At that stage, he hasn't gave birth yet to all creation. All of them was not consummated into him yet where he gave birth to a new creation that's in him forever. Okay, so that's the whole thing. Jesus never said you have to pray and become a Christian so that you are born from above. He doesn't say go and baptize yourself. Then you will, the baptism that he refers there is not the water baptism. So we're going to get there now. I'm jumping ahead. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born while he's old? Can he enter his mother's womb again and be born? Jesus answered, I assure you, most solemnly, I tell you, unless a man is born of water, okay, and then some translation says uh, the spirit or even the spirit. If you go and read the translation, it actually means water, which is the spirit, okay, because water is not different. In so many scriptures, we can go and have references where it refers to the spirit of God as water. We sing songs about it. Your spirit is like water. Okay, so so the water refers in this thing just again 
about Jesus. It doesn't refer to the water baptism that John has done. It talks mm. about something else. The birth that Jesus is going to give us, a spiritual birth. You're going to be born from spirit. And what's amazing, mm. if we go on, if we, you know, after he said uh, flesh brings forth flesh and spirit brings forth, uh, forth spirit, it comes and says, so are all of them that is born of the spirit. They like the wind. They don't know where they come from and they don't know where they go. And this mm. is the thing a lot of people miss. So people that are born from the spirit don't know how they came to be from the spirit. Yeah. Because they didn't wow. play a role in it. Because he gave birth. Because <laughs> he is spirit. So wow. he gave birth to them. And that's why they don't know where they come from. And they don't know where they go because they don't need to go somewhere because they already arrived at a place where they are one and living in union with him. And this is so awesome of this scripture and people misinterpret it the whole time. Yeah. So it's actually telling us the whole story about Nicodemus and Jesus said, hey, the kingdom is only happening one day, you, one way. You have to be born from the kingdom. And Jesus is the kingdom. If we go to the book of Daniel, it talks about the statue and the rock that break loose and crash that statue and the kingdom filled the whole earth. So that's Jesus, his kingdom. So the he give birth. So that's the only way that you can be part of his kingdom if he gives you birth. When he says, look, I make all things new. There's not a new creation that's the invention of itself. It can't be. New creation didn't invent himself. It's yeah. a birth from God that he gives because he's the creator. He's the creator of all things. Nothing can exist except through him and from him. And to him, all things exist. So he gives birth to a new realm, a new life, a new world, if we can put it that way, a new heaven. And it's all consummated, according to Ephesians 1 verse 10, into one place in Christ. So we all are born into one body called flesh mm -hmm. of Christ, of body of Christ. And that's where we live at this stage. Wow. Does that answer that for you? That's amazing. Yeah, that's just for amazing. reference, just that's for reference, I can just, I'm just going to put it there, you know, in Luke chapter 3, verse 16, it talks about the spirit uh, and water, water is the spirit, just for reference for some people, just because a lot of people say, well, you know, uh, a lot of people question when you talk about certain things, but what I say is, let's look at it a different way, you are not your own invention, you are a product of God, he gave you birth. Yeah. So uh, the, the whole confusion of uh, uh, people being baptized into the water is because people think that in John chapter 3 verse 5, uh, Jesus is talking about literal water. But literal actually, water. He, yeah, actually he was speaking about the spirit. The spirit. And that's yeah. what I want to touch on if we con can continue now, if it's right with you. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Okay, so I want to go first to First Peter. First Peter chapter three. It yeah. comes and says, "Okay, wait." Verse twenty-one. No, 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 no. I, I don't want to go there. I want to go to First Corinthians. We will go to Peter a little bit later. Let's go to First Corinthians chapter twelve. Okay. It comes and says, "For also by one Spirit we are all baptized into one body." Whether Jew, Greek, whether bond or free, even all were made to drink into one spirit. Wow. Now, this is awesome, Bernal, because it talks about bond and free. So it talks about being a uh, sinner or, you know, it talks about all type of people, not certain people. I can read it again. Again, for also by one spirit. Okay. So that's another topic, the one spirit, because these days uh, people, uh, uh, you know, we preach in church because of doctrine. There's the father and the spirit, and then there's the Holy Spirit, and then there's the spirit of the son. And because we don't understand who Jesus is. Okay, that's the, that's the problem. And that's a topic for some other day about the Trinity that confuse people, because that's also where this whole thing finds its root. And then there's even the discussion about that. Must I be baptized in all three or just in the name of Jesus? You know, there's, there's big issues in church mm. concerning this. Um, but I can read verse 13 again. First Corinthians 12 verse 13. It says, for also by one spirit, we are all baptized into one body. So all are placed into one body. What is that body? The body of Christ. 
So, you know, there's no, and if we go, we're going to read later, there's only one baptism, okay? Whether Jews or Greek, whether born or free, even all were made to drink into one spirit. So we all were made for this one, to drink into this one spirit, to be in this one body, all of us at one time. No one is outside. Everyone is included. Okay, then I want to go to Mark chapter 1. Now we're going to go into John the Baptist and what he has done. Mark chapter 1, and I'm going to start off with verse 4, uh, reading that just. It comes and says, John the Baptist, Baptist appeared in the wilderness, dressed, preaching a baptism, repentance, a change of one's mind for the better, okay, in a door to obtain forgiveness and release from sin. So John's baptism was to obtain a release of sin. What did Jesus came to do? He came to take sin away. So how can there be a release of sin if sin is paid for and sin is dealt with once and for all? How can we then try to, you understand, then Romans chapter 6 doesn't make sense. Then you don't count yourself dead to sin anymore because then everybody is still alive. And then Jesus, who was supposed to take away the sin of the world, has not, but he left the world and he gave an opportunity that you may be one day be free of sin. So then he was not the savior. Mm. Do you understand? Yeah. Okay. Um, let me go on. Um, you know, just on something... Uh, that comes to mind now quickly. You know, the word of God comes and says, it starts, you know, uh, in the Psalms, where it comes and says, the word of God goes out and it's accomplished what it's sent for. It doesn't return, return empty or void. Okay. Now, what does it mean, the word sin? The word sin only means one thing. If you go to the, the Greek and all the stuff and it comes to one word, okay, and it means to miss the mark. That's sin. You miss the mark. So that what you created for, you missed it. And we know that's where Adam, his disobedience made that he missed the mark. So Jesus came, the savior of the world, to make a, bring forth a new way that no one can ever miss the mark. Okay? That's why he dealt with sin. So there is no mark. Okay? If Jesus didn't took away the sin, then he himself is the greatest sinner because he missed the mark, what he came for. What he was sent for, he didn't accomplish. And he returned back and didn't accomplish what he sent for. Mm -hmm. So then he missed the mark. So then he was the greatest sinner. You understand? So there's a lot of arguments where people want to bring in, you know, it's not by you. It's all Jesus. Um, so let me continue quickly here. Um, verse 4. And the baptism appeared in the wilderness preaching. Uh, okay. So John's whole baptism was to release the forgiveness of sins. Okay? And Jesus did it. We know that's why the cross took place. That's what we say. It was the forgiveness of sins. That's why he came. Okay? He dealt with sin. Okay? Yeah. So if we go to Acts chapter 11, verse 16, it says, Then I recall the de 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 declaration of the Lord. How he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Spirit. So this is something else. He said, John baptized, the forgiveness of sin was the baptism of water that John did. But what is coming now, I baptize with Spirit. And yet up to this day, what is every Christian baptized in? Yeah, what is of. their belief? Mm -hmm. What is their belief? They don't believe in the baptism of the spirit. That's a side product they believe in, in a certain way. But they believe more in the water baptism that can save them than the spirit that already saved them. So there's, yeah. there's the, the thing coming in. So, uh, yeah, so I get a point. Uh, then... Uh, why do we see in the book of Acts, uh, why does it look like that the apostles were giving water baptism? Uh, because, uh, this, you know, the story of you, the eunuch and Philip. Yes. 
Um, I want to, okay, let's go there. <laughs> let's just to bring to you quickly, we must remember when we read the Bible, we talk about New Testament, Old Testament, all these concepts of a previous, a new world, and the old world, okay? Old creation, new creation, and it's this whole time two concepts that we read about. And we know that one took place from the Old Testament, and it was running up to where Jesus was born, and he was the beginning of the new, okay? And we know that Jesus talked about Matthew 24, of the destruction of the temple and all the signs that will follow with it, and that will bring forth the new, okay? So when we talk about old and new, so we have old creation, if I can use my hands as circles, and we have the new creation, okay? New, old world, new world. So if I come and overlap it, and I say this way, this one starts is where Jesus was born. This one was where the destruction of the temple take place. So this is the end of the old one. This is the start of the new one. Okay. There's a certain period in the middle where the two overlaps. Okay. okay. And a lot of times we read in the scripture that Jesus was the go between. Mm. Okay. He was the interceder. So he was the go-between agents be between the old and the new. So there was a period of time where the old and the new was overshadowing. Okay? And the one had to come to an end. And the one starts to be glorious and shining brighter and brighter every day. Now, we are not living in the old. We are living in the new. So there was a time period where it, we call that small period between the old and the new where it overlaps. Okay? That period we call the grace period that people refer to, the faith period that people also try to read in the Bible, because when we, we must come to the conclusion that the Bible was written in a period, Testament was written in the period from Jesus' birth until Jesus was away, and then his disciples following, and they were looking for all of these things until the second coming, okay? But what we skip is where in Matthew 24, in Luke chapter 10, all these scriptures where it actually comes and Jesus say to them, you're going to go from every town and you will not go even to every town of Jerusalem yet. Then I will be back with my kingdom. Okay, so was Jesus a liar or did he finish it? In Matthew 24, he comes and says to his disciples, some of you that standing here will see all of this and it will be fulfilled in your time. And what was the question? What will be the sign of your coming? What will be the sign of the end? The end of what? The end of the old world, the mm -hmm. old creation. So they witness the beginning of the new, but also the ending of the old. And we read ourselves into that little uh, circle, the go-between, the middle area. We read ourselves every time in there, and we feel like we are still waiting for fulfillment of stuff. So they had to rely, because they were still also part of the old. That's why all the apostles needed to die. They needed to, to form the foundation. Okay, so they had they lived in that period where it was still bringing to the end. The full cycle was to be completed of the old, but they already started to taste the new. So they had to do certain things because the new, the old was not dealt with or not completed in full extent. Okay. Because if we read about Jesus, Matthew 24, he says, this temple will be broken down and I will raise it or build it in three days. And then we know what was he referring to, to his body. Okay, which is his body? We are the body. So if we want to talk about baptism, actually what Jesus tells his, his disciples, you will see the, the destruction of the temple, the completion of the old. And you will see my new body that I prepared also living, which is going to be you. Okay, so you're going to experience the new. Okay, so if we talk about baptism, laying down of the old and raising of the new. So whose work was it? Is it ours and our faith or is it Jesus? You understand? So all that water baptism that we read in the New Testament was in a certain period of time. And we read ourselves now that we are living in the new. We like to read ourselves into the old because our Bible stopped there. Our Bible stopped just before the destruction of the temple. Our Bible didn't continue. So our Bible only comes and concludes how the old ended. But it gives us just a, a little glimpse of the new. 
And we are living in the new. We are reconciled to God. We're living in the kingdom. We are living in the new creation. So, so we don't have an idea. The Bible doesn't give us an idea what this newness is. Now people continuously try to bring the old things into the new so that they think that is going to make them experience the new. Because in the mind, they are still separate. Because that's what the word comes and says. You can never be separated from God. It's only our mind that alienates us from him. So our mindset is keeping us in the experience of him. And because we are raised with all stuff, and that we try to apply to our lives to make ourselves better believers, you know, and all this stuff, we try to better ourselves the whole time, and we do not accept the finished work, what he has done. And live in the new. I hope it's answer what you asked, Bernal. Wow, wow, wow. Uh, you know, yeah. uh, if we got some other time, we can talk about the, the two ages, you know, the new yeah. world and the old world. You know, a lot of people get scary when you talk about it. They want to say, oh, so you are the new age, you know, or into the <laughs> new age. Yes, because Jesus brought it forth. He dealt with the old age, the law age. He dealt with all creation. That's what Adam has done. No effect with Christ. Which the void of in one with, and it's time that that arise within us. When you realize he has risen, you have risen with him. So the risen Christ lives in us, and there's no separation. Then it changed the whole picture about life for us. Wow. So uh, to put it simply, that. Uh, um 70 AD, 70 years after the after Jesus uh, was the destruction of the temple and when the temple was destroyed the uh, the old age ended and the new beginning started that's what you're saying and so that's just before so uh, right from the death of Jesus to the uh, to uh, the destruction of the temple, in 70 AD, in between, uh, when uh, they used to give the water baptism, right? They used to eat because, remember, they were still part of the old, so they were trying. Remember, the apostles were working also with Jewish people. So they were reducing Jewish, uh, how can I say it, uh, rituals to bring forth the message of Christ. And if we go, and that's what I'm going to read quickly for you, what they try also in First Peter, because that's what Peter, when he says, uh, try to explain what baptism is, according to him, to the people in that age, uh, okay? Uh, so if we go to First Peter chapter 3, verse 20, he comes and says, the souls of those who long before the days of Noah had been disobedient when God, uh, patience waiting during the building of the ark, in which a few people actually in number was saved through water now he comes and says his opinion about baptism in verse 21 so he says and baptism which is a figure of the deliverance does now also save you uh, from inward questioning and fear not by the removing of outward body filth but by the answer of good and clear conscience before god so they were working with people that were living still in the old world where the law also were playing the role and there was a lot of scribes and pharisees the mindset of the people needed to be changed they were used to a certain way of religion and they were following the system of this religion now he had to bring them out of this and the water baptism was for that period to help them to let go of their old belief system to of that law that comes and uh, beguiled them the whole time beguiling the conscience and say hey you didn't do the ten commandments you didn't do the law you are disobedient to the law therefore you are a child of the wrath of god you deserve god's punishment you know that rule so they had psychologically psych also have to to work with that people so that that people can make a step to let go of the all so that they can experience it now we want to as as people that lives in 2021 we want to um, read ourselves into that time and like we are people that wants to get fr uh, released from that system that jesus ended that he brought to nothing and where he brought the new, now we still recognize the old more than the new. And if we still recognize the old more, we cannot experience the new in its fullness because of our mindsets, not because it's not there. 
You, you understand? So, so <laughs> that's the whole thing. A lot of people believe only things exist if they believe in it. Okay. So if I buy a car, you can believe me that I buy a car uh, and you will say, I will believe it only uh, Gerard has a new car since, until I see it. It doesn't matter what you believe. If I bought the car, I experienced that car. If you see it or not, are you with me? Just because I haven't shown it to you doesn't make it unreal. But that's what people try because they didn't see God giving birth to the new. They don't accept the new. Therefore, they are waiting for something else to happen, a second coming to come in a different way. And Jesus said he's not going to come in that way. He's coming so that he can fill all with himself. So he talks about he comes in his original form, which is spirit. And that spirit is going to fill all, you know, and that's where we come to the baptism of what is the baptism of Christ. If John's baptism was a water baptism, that was the uh, washing off of sin. And Peter say, hey, this is not supposed to be a thing of sin, but it's now to clean the conscious. Okay. Jesus actually, it's nothing to do with it. It's giving new birth. You know, he comes and says, uh, at the end, uh, uh, okay, now I must just get the scripture right before I quote it. <laughs> it says, uh, and in the last days, okay, he will pour his spirit out on all flesh. Not some flesh, not selected flesh, all flesh. So what was the last days? So it was talking about what has last days, the old creation. So on the last days of the old creation, God's spirit was poured out onto all flesh that brings the new. So that everyone is brought into Christ. Now we also read the scripture, you know, the first one, he says he destroyed the old uh, before the law with uh, uh, Noah, he destroyed the earth with water. And that's where Peter tries to come and jump in. But then we say the second destruction will be with fire. Okay, and a lot of people are waiting for fire and they think it's the hell that is fire. Where hell is not in our Bibles and fire is not hell. hell, to, uh, hell talk, uh, fire talks about God. It comes and says, our God is a consuming fire. So the spirit, which is God is a consuming fire so baptism with the spirit means he baptized the old creation he came and he over he poured out his spirit and his spirit consumed the old and made all things new so that everything that was old everything that was displeased all sin all unbelief all that stuff he vanished by himself taking it into himself and made it to naught so that the new is the only thing that stands. Wow. wow if we go wow, read, wow. even even Paul says, he comes and says, I think it's in Hebrews, if I'm I, I can't be corrected, but he says, uh, there's a kingdom to be received that cannot be shaken. So yet once more there will be a shake. Now he refers wow. to what shake? The end of the all, 70 after Christ. Okay, he refers to that as the final shake. Of the shaking off that everything that can be shaken, destroyed and taken up, consumed by God, so that only the new is left. And that's where the only glimpse we get of it is in Revelation, where John comes and writes and says, uh, he heard the one saying, look, I made all things new. So what did he do? He consumed the old, made the old of nothing, so that only the new is now in front of them. Uh, people reconciled back to him, enjoying unbroken fellowship with him. I hope it makes sense, Vernal. And of course, I bring yes. clarity to what you. It is so clear here. now. It's so clear now. So basically, to if if you if if I want to sum it up, uh, I would say that uh, uh, the baptism uh, that uh, is spoken, the, the 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 famous verse that is John chapter three. Uh, where it is talking about being born again and Nicodemus uh, uh, being baptized in uh, water and uh, spirit. That water actually means spirit. So once it's you understand spirit. that, the 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 whole confusion gets uh, uh, gets off. Yeah, because and what it tries to say is, if you go read on, because we we they aim to stop there because the explanation actually goes on. And he comes and says, uh, flesh mm -hmm. bring forth flesh. 
So mm -hmm. if it was just water, water, if it's just physical water, physical water can do nothing. You have yeah. to be born from the spirit. You have to be born from above. That's yeah. what the whole thing. And therefore, the spirit must give you birth. And that's the baptism that he refers to. The spirit yeah. that gives life. And yeah. that's what G the end of that old age and the beginning mm -hmm. of the new or where the new starts to, to shine brighter is where the spirit was poured on all so that the old disappeared and he gave birth to a whole new creation. That's what he yeah. gave birth to. Look, I made all things new, a birth yeah. of everything new. So the second second question where people normally ask, why did the disciples were used to the apostle used to baptize people uh, in the book of Acts on the early church? And the answer is because uh, the the old has not yet gone away. And it the was new, still bringing to an end. It was yeah, still running the cycle to bring it to bring an end. to the end. So. Uh, it was 70 AD when the temple was destroyed. That was when the old just uh, uh, went away and the new came in completely. So uh, they were still into that phase where they were giving water baptism to change the mindset of Jewish mindset of, of the Jews, right? That's yeah. right. That's right, Venom. Awesome. So That's how yeah. I understand it. Yeah. And that's how, uh, you know, that's how it, uh, if I read the scriptures, that's how it makes sense to me. Absolutely. Because otherwise we get into things, if we go even to Ephesians chapter 4, you know, it comes and says, there is one body, there is one spirit, even as you are all called into one hope of your calling, and one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. It doesn't talk about many baptism, it talks about one baptism, and that's the baptism into this body. The new creation, the body of Christ that we are all now into because he gave birth to us all. Because one seed fell yeah. into the ground to bring many sons into glory. And we are the sons that's into the glory. Not because of Absolutely. faith, but because of his faith that Absolutely. he produces us. Absolutely. So what does being born again mean? You see, there's one thing again. We, we try to say that uh, certain people are more privileged than others because yeah. born again people is now people that if we, if we translate what religion says born again is it's people that make a decision that they're going to lay themselves down and they receive God and they do what God says and now they are born from God so actually what we're saying spirit can only give birth to spirit if flesh commits it to do it or pro, pro, perhaps it to, or, uh, enables it to do it or gives it uh, the right to do it. And mm -hmm. that cannot be because then flesh gives birth to spirit. But it's mm -hmm. not. You understand? So when we talk about a new uh, born again, it means it only talks about the concept of Jesus giving birth to a mm -hmm. whole new way of life, a mm -hmm. whole way of creation, a new creation, and not yeah. the old. And the new creation yeah, because, he gave birth to. Because when we hear the word being born again, uh, it gives us the idea, the mainstream Christians portray this idea where you are being born again. I mean, you are taking the initiative of being born. But the yes. truth that Jesus was trying to say is that, hey, you are going to be born uh, through me now. Because I decide so. Because I decide so. That's what he was saying. <laughs> it's, it's not about me making a decision of going into the water and coming out of the water. And that what makes us born again. But it That's is Jesus That's making a truth. decision that he is giving birth to each one of us. That's so true. Another thing, Vernal, what's very important, you know, we, we call what is baptism? It's part of sacraments. We call it the sacraments. And there's a few sacraments in Christianity. There's a few uh, sacraments, even in Roman Catholic, that the Christians brought and they brought actually a list of them and make them their own. You understand if I talk about not saying Roman Catholics are not Christian, uh, they're also Christian. But I said the general Christian churches, as we see separate from the Catholic Church, they narrow it down to three normally. Okay, where it's the communion, the baptism, and what's the other one? Uh, marriage. And marriage. 
Yeah, that's true. So, so we brought those three in. And if we go and look at it, okay, those things refer to a symbol of something. And if we go to Colossians chapter 2, it says all this stuff is symbols of rituals that show forth to the genuine. But we keep on doing it. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe another time, you know, say that we are dealing now with this one sacrament, the, the baptism. Uh, a lot of people use communion and they don't understand what that means. And they don't understand what communion actually is supposed to be. And they make it drinking wine and eating bread, thinking that's the body of Christ. And that's the blood of Christ, which is not. Because if I look at you, I see the body of Christ because you are the body of Christ. No bread is the body of Christ. So it's also something that had a purpose for a certain period and people use it and they bring it in because they still read themselves in that era just to, to bring it in there. Because if we go to uh, where Paul writes, you know, in Thessalonians, he comes and says that do this as often as possible until Christ returns. And a lot of people are doing it because they believe that Christ has not returned. So that's wow. why they have communion, where it was only a symbol of having fellowship. So I cannot see God because God must come. So I have at least a symbol that resembles him saying he's mine. I'm taking part in him. Where the true reality is his spirit dwells in us. The true essence that that symbol showed unto is mm -hmm. living in us, and I have now unbroken fellowship. My fellowship is not bread and wine when I eat and drink and have fellowship with the symbols and thinking that makes me feel closer to God or more one with God. The reality is I'm now born out of God. I'm born from God, and he made us one body, <laughs> me and mm -hmm. him, and he mm -hmm. called it that body himself, the body of Christ. So there's no separation. I'm living a life filled and flooded with him, unbroken fellowship with him. So it's, we, we use symbols. And the same, the baptism was used as a symbol for bringing release, perfection, what was accomplished, uh, what Jesus brought to an end. But we yet don't believe it. That's why we hang into the symbols of these things. And we do not enjoy the fulfillment of that symbols and the true thing that that symbol showed unto and enjoy fellowship with the genuineness, the true spirit, which is Jesus, which is God, the Father. Yeah, this is so this is so good. And it's so important for everybody who calls themselves Christian to understand uh, that we are in him. Uh, and we are in him, uh, you know, not when we decide to take the baptism. We are yes. in him even before we were born. That is, that's what, what he comes and says. He says, while you were yet sinners, he reconciled us back to himself. Mm. So what's that reconciliation? We try now with the symbols that we were inherited from an old system, an old world. We inherited it from that. We try to apply that and think that is going to give us the new. We, we must wake up to righteousness. We are in the righteousness. We are in the kingdom. We must wake up to what was done for us. It's not going to be given. It's not going to be done. We waken to what he has done for us. And that's the great mystery. You know, it says this is the great mystery that was hidden for ages and generations from angels and man, but it's now revealed to God's holy people. What was it? Christ within and yeah. among you. So Christ in you and surrounding you. Oh, what a hope of glory. So a lot of people say the hope and they're hoping for it. They don't realize, no, this is the, you are not doing the hope. God hope that you get and wake up to this reality that he prepared for you, that he placed you into the, into himself for you to enjoy the new creation, the new reality of him. You see the problem, sorry, when I think I may be going long, but I, I think it's important because just to answer a few questions that may yeah. pop into people's mind. When we talk about God, you know, the whole Trinity thing is a big problem in our belief system because that's where the separation comes in because people believe that the spirit is now, Jesus was walking on this earth. He went back to the father and he sent the spirit, the Holy Spirit. Now Jesus and the father is sitting in heaven and the Holy Spirit is with us. And now they're waiting for Jesus to come back, to come and take us and the spirit to the father. Okay. Mm. Are you with yeah. me in the old sense? But if we realize that God is spirit, okay. And Jesus said himself, God is spirit. And those who worship him 
must worship him in spirit and truth. But just the verse before it, he says, the father needs true worshipers. God is spirit. So he comes and he says, father, the God, father, God is spirit. And if we go back to Genesis 1, it says the spirit of God hovered upon the waters and said, let there be light. So the spirit created in John chapter 1. We come and we read, uh, you know, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God himself. And then it comes says, through him, the word, all things were made. So is it the spirit that created? Is it the word that created, which is Jesus? Because in the same chapter of John, it comes and says the word became flesh. Talking about Jesus. So was it the word that created, the spirit that created, or the father that created? You see, we divide it in certain things. And we yeah. must realize that it is one. The original yeah. form of God is spirit. And spirit cannot be seen. So God decided that he's not going to take this misinterpretation of what he says anymore. He's going to manifest himself so that people can see his true expression. And that's what John, uh, you know, what Paul comes around. He says Jesus was the firstborn. He was the true expression of the unseen God. So he was spirit made visible. Okay. For all to yeah. see. Mm -hmm. And that's why Jesus says to Thomas and to the others, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. If I'm not being with you so long. So he is the Spirit. And if we go all the way back to Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, or is it 6 mm -hmm. verse 9? I'm not sure. One of those two. 9 verse 6 or 6 verse 9. It comes and says, it says, a son will, it will be given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and his name shall be Mighty God, Prince of Peace. Okay, there it comes already. Uh, 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 what's the other one? Uh, we call the Holy Spirit the... Jesus help me. Uh, counselor. Counselor, counselor. Yeah, he says mighty God, counselor. And then he comes and add in everlasting father. So the prophecy about Jesus is the father is going to be born as a son. Wow. And yet, so why do we, why do we see that way? Sorry to interrupt, but why do we see Jesus praying to the father when he's on earth? What is okay. the whole so, logic about it? If I'm the body of Christ, why do I still pray to Christ? Because Christ refers to the spirit that dwells in me. So Jesus was the body, the expression of God. He was the flesh, but the spirit was still in him. So now he's talking to the spirit, his original form that is indwelling in that body. So that's what he talks about. So even Nicodemus saw it. He says, hey, a man can only do this if God is with him. Meaning God dwelling in you. This is the only. So Jesus was the first person in the whole history of Bible where the spirit of God dwelt in a body. Previously, we read all over scripture. The spirit of God came upon the prophet and the prophet do this and this and this. And the spirit left him again. You know, there was always the visitation. Jesus was the first one where the indwelling spirit stayed. We only read of one uh, uh, Thing about where John baptized Jesus and he saw and we, we misread it John saw as a sign okay and that's what we read the spirit came like a dove and abide on him but that was a sign for John because there was a prophecy about that that he says uh, I know it was said that once we see the spirit descending and abide on somebody and stays with that one then this one will baptize with the spirit you understand awesome. so we must see it also in that reference it's not that god was separate at that time it was a sign for john to awesome. see that so, awesome. so we, we we like to break up god in three different aspects so that we can separate ourselves from him and that's why the church are waiting because they believe they only received a part of God. The spirit dwells now with them. And the rest must come. And that's not it. The fullness. The fullness of God. Come and Paul's right it. He says the fullness of the Godhead dwells in us bodily. So we are not separate. It's not that Jesus must come. He brought everything already. He's Emmanuel. God with wow. us. Wow. This was amazing. This was amazing. Really enjoyed this stuff and the way you have simplified and bro broke it down um uh so uh, the whole thing about this podcast is it's not the water that makes you born again it is jesus that makes you born again it it's is not your decision. yeah 
it is not your decision that makes you born again it is the spirit that makes you born again that and is, uh, that and is. and if we focus on uh, the whole thing about the whole thing about going into the water and coming out of the water then we are trusting the water as something that is giving us birth like the water has got supernatural power exactly so the the truth is it's it's the truth is we are already born through Christ Jesus and that's also what's happening in John 3 that we we read about the Jesus and Nicodemus as we say that what the spirit brings forth is spirit and then he says those who are born from the spirit is like the wind they don't know where they come from and that's what people misread they think it means you you are a mess you you can do just whatever and people don't understand awesome. it that's what it says your birth you so will the, so even the, know where so the from. truth is everybody on this earth is born and is a new creation from god everybody no one on this earth no one on this earth is their own creation we are all his own handiwork i mean that's what john for nothing came into being to existence by itself but all things were made by him and for him and that's what we must understand we are not made by ourselves and we decide to be for him he made us and gave birth to us for himself so so the truth is everybody on this earth is born again everybody on this earth <laughs> but the problem is not everybody knows that they are living in the new Exactly. and that's what the good news is all about we think the good news is to go and tell people that they have to change their lifestyle and they have to receive something and they have to have a choice and then they can receive something and that's not good news vernal then it's back in our hands good news is doesn't matter what you do here it is and that's love love doesn't come and see yeah. if you can earn it or you deserve it and then it's given no he gave it because he loves So he has done it for us all so that we can see. I normally say you know we went and we have this mentality that we must go and we must save the world. I'm not there to save the world. The message that I preach cannot even save the world. Baptism cannot even save a person because we confess that Jesus is the savior. So if he's the savior, I believe that he did save. He accomplished what he was sent for. What the so when you say for he accomplished when, when you say being saved what do you actually mean because you said hell doesn't exist so being saved from the, what the signal is break um okay okay sorry it's breaking up a little bit there uh, there's no sound there's no sound right now so when you are saying uh, being saved you just use the word save so uh, what are we getting saved from like i i heard you saying what, there's no what, hell what, right yes so what i want to say when when i when when you are saved it means jesus came and do the saving before you were even born so you are originally already part from the the saving mission you are the the success of it but the trying to get saved he came and that's what he has done and we are already living in the victory that he has brought and that's why we read scriptures and says you are more than a conqueror and yet people try to conquer but what they don't realize is jesus had conquer and just by us being giving birth as a new creation we are victorious we don't try to be victorious i don't um, know, know if that is yeah the, the question that i uh, i'm having is like uh when we use the word save what are we getting saved from uh because uh, you said i mean the mainstream okay. christian said you get saved from going to hell after death but i heard okay, you saying so there's no hell say, right that's right you know the word hell is not in the bible only in the english bible that's only way way with that word hell exists everywhere else you know in the the greek and uh, it is gehenna it's different yeah. hate it's different words so it's got different meanings so But what the, are we getting saved from you are getting saved from a life separate from god 
by missing the mark, a life in the old. You were saved from that, but you don't get saved right now. You were uh -huh. saved by him. So, so it's sometimes a process that we have to get in our minds because the saving took place before we were born. So people miss it because they want to be part of the saving process. And that's why they want to follow a process and they won't accept that the saving was done. Okay, so if I go to, to India and I have a boat and I come and say there's a great big tsunami on its way to Goa, I go with a boat and I save the people and I took you to another island there to Kerala side. Okay, and I put you on the beach there and now you establish society there and you live there. Okay, now you are a new society, old Goans living somewhere else. And now you get children and they are born. Are they going to now want to be safe from Goa or are they safe from Goa? You see, and that's where we come. We live many years after the work of the, what Jesus came, the Messiah, what he came to save. And now yet we want to bring ourselves and our will into his saving pro, uh, uh, progress yeah. and say we can only be safe if we allow to be safe. But he has done. He came to save humanity. If yeah. one died, all died. Uh, if by one man's uh, disobedience, all brought into sin, by one man's obedience, all were saved. So what is greater, Adam or Jesus? Because everybody said they want to see Adam still succeed. And they believe that Adam is still succeeding in their life. And they try to get rid of Adam. And baptism is a way to get rid of, of Adam. They think what they need to realize what Jesus came to do is bigger and greater. And actually what Romans chapter 5 says, it cannot even be compared with what Adam has done. It superseded it. It's far beyond that. And that's what we must realize. So when we talk about saving, we're actually referring just to the act of what Jesus came to do to end of the old and to bring all humanity into a new existence, wow. a new world where they are reconciled so and save, not separated from them. So saving has nothing to do about going to hell or heaven. No, because oh. what is heaven? You know, that's another concept. Because if we go and read uh, the Bible, Paul comes and writes, he says, we are seated with him in the heavenly sphere. And the heavenly sphere is only translation because it actually comes and says you are seated in heaven. But people couldn't handle it. That's why they say heavenly sphere, because it sounds less. You know, the reality of it, maybe it's a little bit less. Okay, but you're already seated there. How are you seated there? Because you are born from above. You are born there. You are give birth from that reality. And what is heaven? Heaven is Jesus, because it says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10, he consummated all things, all things in heaven, all things in earth, into one place called in Christ Jesus. So wow. where is heaven? Heaven is in Christ. So what is hell? Hell is not a thing in the Bible. Hell is mm -hmm. only in mindset of people that believe they are separated from God if we have to give hell our identity. It's been separated in their minds, not knowing the reality of Christ, punishing themselves, trying with their own efforts to get out of Adam while they're already freed from Adam. So they're trying to get out of a dead thing that already died. It's like riding a dead horse, but you don't want to climb off. The horse is a long time not running. But you think you are still on it. <laughs> that ship already sailed a long time ago. Wow. We are in the new creation, uh, living the new life. And we mm -hmm. also read it, you know, in Hebrews chapter 12. It says, you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the most High. Not you going to, you have come. And that's what awesome. we must realize. That's our new life. Awesome. Before, when, before we were born, humanity was brought up to that state. Awesome. Sorry. This has been such a such a good and fruitful podcast today. Literally debunking, debunking the yes. baptism uh, ideology, uh, the but concept you know, that Bernal, Christians had. Yeah. Well, it's like you said, and I, I see your post on Facebook that you said, you know, people like to judge things according to their. I don't say believe what I believe. But they say experience to experience. And if we look for excuses, we're not getting that experience. Not that the experience is not there. The experience is for everyone. And God is in everyone. But to make the decision to experience him is not by giving birth to yourself. No, it's just to accept what he has done. You know, and That's what it. I was busy with when I said a lot of people say you must go and preach the gospel and that's how you save people. Okay, I say Jesus did do the saving work. My work as minister 
or as evangelist or as a, a messenger of the good news is that Jesus succeeded in the saving word. That's my role. My, my role is not to try to save people. My, my role is to tell people Jesus succeeded. He did save all of us by his work. I, I think I think uh, uh, we need to end this podcast on that note because okay. uh, because uh, <laughs> most of the people talk about and most of the Christians are out there trying to save people by preaching the gospel. But the truth is we are supposed to tell people that Christ has already saved them. He succeeded. In he his succeeded. <laughs> yeah. He succeeded Amen. in his mission. And uh, there's nothing on uh, now that you need to go ahead and save somebody. All are saved in Christ, um, uh, you know, Amen. by him and not by the water Amen. or any kind of uh, 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 dipping yourself in water. So awesome. So amazing. Uh, and I, I, I'm I, sure uh, all those uh, viewers who are watching this podcast have got their minds cleared about this concept of baptism. I think we really need to uh, think uh, outside the box if we really want to seek the truth and understand yes. the truth uh, and not go by what traditions have taught us, uh, what uh, uh, past theology have taught us, but really to understand the heart and the essence of the scriptures. So, uh, really want to thank you, uh, Prophet Gerard, for this amazing, amazing time that you have opened up and cleared up the scriptures for us, the concept of baptism. And I'm sure uh, this is going to bring a true enlightenment to all of us to understand and experience God in a very new way. So thank you once Amen. again for uh, co coming and sharing and always being willing uh, each time I ask you for uh, for a podcast with me, you always been willing. So thank you so much. God bless you. It's only my privilege, Vernal, and I love you, my brother. And keep going. And <laughs> bless all of you. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank bless you so you much. Bless you, guys. Bless you and keep watching. Do subscribe. Prophet Jared has his own YouTube channel. Uh, please subscribe to his YouTube channel. And he's also coming up with some awesome stuff on his YouTube cha channel, uh, like yoga and all that stuff. So get on his YouTube channel. It's amazing. Uh, and you get to learn some deep stuff uh, from the word of God. Uh, so do subscribe him and check him out on his Facebook and on all the uh, social platform that he is on. We'll be putting his link down on this description of this video. So go ahead and check him out. God bless you and see you soon. Bye.